Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and I have a question for you. Have you ever met someone who is good at everything? I mean, no matter what they try, no matter what they put their hands to, they can excel at it. Well, there's a guy who I work with, and he has it all. If there's a computer problem, he can fix it. Uh, a little while ago, he picked up guitar, and already he's better than some people who have been practicing for months. Uh, he can sail. He can cook. He's an amazing chef. Literally, if you give him something to do, give him only an hour, and he'll learn how to do it better than people that have been doing it for years. Well, our saint, who we're going to be talking about today, she was kind of like that. Her name is St. Hildegard von Bingen, and she was proficient in so many different things. She was good at theology. Uh, she was good at medicine. She wrote music and poetry. She even wrote biology textbooks and so much more. She's a brilliant woman. Her work is actually so influential, this genius, that the church recognized how important her writings were. Pope Benedict XVI in the year 2012, he gave St. Hildegard von Bingen the prestigious title of Doctor of the Church. And he said that he gave that to her for her holiness of life and for the originality of her teaching. So her holy life and all of the brilliant things she was able to write about and give to the church. And so let's learn about this amazing saint. It all started in the year 1098 when a baby girl was born to a noble family in Western Germany. Little Hildegard was born and she was actually a very sick child. From her very early age, uh, she would go through these periods of extreme illness, which would render her sometimes unable to walk. Uh, unable to properly see for long periods of time. But from a very early age, little Hildegard would see visions of God. She would see visions of heavenly things, saints, angels, and she even had knowledge of the future. So as little kids are wont to do, uh, she'd go and tell her parents, she'd tell her uh, friends, and she was actually scared to realize that not everyone saw things like she did. She assumed everyone could know the future. She assumed everyone could see visions of God. But when they responded with surprise or even fear, she actually stopped telling people about these visions because she was afraid how people would look at her. And so she stopped telling people about these visions, even though she continued to have them. When she was only eight years old, she was sent to live at a convent in order to be trained by the nuns there how to live a life for God. But since she was such a sickly child, the nuns had a hard time teaching her. It took her a long time to learn things because she was so weak from her many illnesses. But she did end up loving it there. She loved the life of the convent. She decided to stay there and become a Benedictine nun, which is what she did. She took her vows, became a Benedictine nun at that convent. And when she was 38 years old, uh, the abbess, which is the head nun of the convent, kind of the boss of the other sisters, she died. And because of her holiness and because of her wisdom that was already uh, being revealed in her life, the sisters of the convent decided to make Hildegard the new abbess. So at 38 years old, she was in charge of the convent and the visions and the voices that she had heard since she was a child, they had continued throughout her life. And one day in one of these visions, God told her, write down what you see and hear in order to share it with other people. Now Hildegard was nervous. She remembered what it was like as a child to share these visions and have people look at her strangely. She was nervous about what people would think about her, and she didn't want to do it. She was resistant to what God was asking her to do, but the voice kept urging her. Hildegard, write down what you see, write down what you hear. But she kept putting it off. Finally, she came down with another serious bout of illness, which left her bedridden. And as she was in her bed, thinking and hearing this voice, she finally realized 
that it wasn't about her. It was about what God wanted her to do. And she stopped resisting and she finally wrote down her visions. Now, these visions, uh, if you read them, they are intense. They talk about so many different things. There's themes of creation and how God created the world. And there's themes of the fall and how humanity uh, broke their relationship with God and, and went into the darkness of sin. There's themes of how uh, Jesus Christ came to save sinful humanity, came to redeem creation and establish the church and the sacraments in order to bring about this salvation. She has visions about uh, the future coming kingdom of God and the, the final tensions between good and evil. All these visions that she had, they're very mystical. Uh, they're very heavy with symbols. There's a lot of imagery uh, in which she uses to describe the visions of heavenly things. So she uses earthly terms, earthly symbols and colors and images in order to describe these heavenly realities that God is showing her. Now, when Hildegard had written down all of these visions, she brought them to her spiritual director. In obedience, she said, you know what? I think God is calling me to write these down and share them with people, but I wanted to bring them to you first in order to make sure that uh, these really are from God and would be beneficial for the church. So she brought it to her spiritual director. Uh, she brought it to the abbot who her convent was associated with. Uh, and eventually her visions were brought before the bishop. And all of them, her spiritual director, the abbot, uh, her bishop, all of them agreed that she was for real. That the visions she was seeing, that the voices she was hearing were actually coming from God. And so they allowed her to have these writings carried all over Europe and people read them and had deep encounters with God through these mystical writings that she was giving. Now, uh, she didn't stop there though. Hildegard continued to write not only these deep theological works that we've been talking about, and all of her continued visions, but she also began to write in all of these different uh, ways, in music, in scientific studies, in poetry. Uh, in fact, uh, when it comes to music, Hildegard is actually one of the most prolific medieval composers in history. We have so many works of hers, these beautiful musical compositions that come from this time in the medieval times. Uh, she is most famous for writing this musical, which tells uh, an allegorical story of this human soul who is searching for God. And this soul is searching for God through a life of virtue, but has to overcome the devil's temptation along the way. So she wrote this allegorical musical where each of the characters uh, expresses their longing for God in different songs and the, the devil comes in and he tries to, to distract the soul from finding God. And this musical would have actually been performed in the convent with the other sisters. She would have given each of the sisters a different part to play in her musical. They would have done it together. Uh, and honestly, the music is gorgeous. It's, it's inspired. It's, I believe, anointed by God because when you listen to it, there's this peacefulness and it lifts the heart up to God. As I was preparing for this radio show, um, I was listening to her music in the background and it was bringing me so much peace and consolation and it was lifting my heart up to God. You can really see how this musical ability that she had came from her relationship with God and from time spent in prayer with him. Now, Hildegard, as I mentioned, was also proficient in medicine. She uh, acted as one of the doctors at the convent. She spent a lot of time nursing people, her own sisters, but also the poor and the sick who came to the convent, nursing them back to health and then teaching them how to heal each other through the created world that God has made for us. Uh, so she wrote a lot of different books on the healing properties of different plants and animals, how you could use different plants and herbs to make remedies to heal different diseases and illnesses. Uh, and she experimented on how to make different medication through the herbs that she grew in her convent garden. So she was a gardener. She had this huge garden in the convent that she would grow all these different herbs and experiment with them how to make people better again who were sick or in pain. She wrote textbooks on human anatomy. She studied the human body. She made observations, wrote them all down, and she wrote many other scientific writings, not always just for work, 
but also for some fun because uh, Hildegard also wrote, for instance, what the best kind of hops could be used to make beer. She loved beer, she knew how to make good beer, and she wanted to write books so that other sisters would be able to make as good a beer as she could. So uh, the created world fascinated Hildegard. She loved nature and plants and animals and why God made it because she believed that everything in creation had been made by God for a purpose. And she was curious. She wanted to know what that purpose was to extract that information and then write a book about it. That was Hildegard's modus operandi. Uh, she had a very creative mind as well. She didn't just delve into the sciences, but also into the imagination and, and her creative powers. Uh, it led her to write this beautiful poetry that she used to express her deep love for God, for Mary, uh, for the saints. And she wrote with a very free flowing, a very spontaneous style. Again, because she had a love for nature and the created world, um, many of her poems are inspired by natural imagery. And she draws from that inspiration in order to praise the creator of all of this. And so these poems were written and they too are very beautiful, lift the soul up to God. Now Hildegard, because of her visions, but also because of her, her wisdom and her kindness and her holiness, her fame began to spread throughout the whole region and even beyond Germany to the rest of Europe as people from all different classes came to the convent to seek her wisdom. So this included peasants, the local lowly people, the farmers, the tradesmen that would come to ask her advice, the nobles, even bishops came to seek her wisdom and she treated them all with the same respect, the same dignity, and gave them the wisdom that God had given her as a gift. Uh, even the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor Frederick, invited her to come to his house to have an audience with her, to speak with this woman whose fame was rapidly growing. But when people couldn't make it to the convent, she corresponded to them by letter. She wrote letters all over Europe with clergy, world leaders all over Europe, uh, noblemen, kings, queens, bishops, all of them seek her wisdom. And she was writing letters constantly to all these different places. Uh, her wisdom, her holiness, and her prophetic insight were much sought after. And she had even more to say than she could in these different audiences and these different letters. And so she actually went on different preaching tours throughout the whole of Europe. She traveled around giving uh, addresses to large crowds of people. People flocked from all over to hear her because she preached with such conviction, such eloquence, such articulation. And she preached repentance from sin. She preached that uh, the the desires of the heart need to be directed towards God. That the created world is beautiful and good, but we are not to be so caught up in that that we forget who the creator is. That we need to have uh, an eternal focus, a focus on spending our eternity with God in heaven. And as a necessary means of getting to heaven, uh, she called for a radical surrender to Jesus as Lord of everything, that he's the only way to heaven. And she decried those who continued on in their sin, especially the clergy, the priests who lived worldly and sinful lives. She was not afraid to call a spade a spade. She was not afraid to call priests and even other bishops to repentance to say, look, you need to clean up your act. You need to get right with God. And people listened to her. Many people came to conversion, came to a deeper understanding of the lordship of Jesus because of this woman's preaching. Now, in the Middle Ages, this was not a normal thing. It was not normal for women to be public speakers, certainly not to preach about God, but God had anointed her for this very specific mission. And the priests and the bishops, they recognized in her this prophetic gift from God, this zeal that had been given to her by God, and they listened to it, and they let her preach, and preach she did all over the place. Now again, because she was so famous, uh, many young women wanted to become nuns with her convent. She had many 
many young ladies coming to her convent seeking to become nuns with her and so because of all of these women who were coming she was able to start two brand new convents in order to accommodate them all uh, she was the spiritual mother to all of them she taught them how to live the christian life uh, she helped them to deepen their love for jesus as her daughters she really took this motherly care for their souls to lead them into this relationship with Jesus that she exemplified with everything she did and with everything she said. Now, as you can tell, uh, Hildegard, she lived a very busy life. It was filled with writing and preaching and founding convents and leading convents, uh, but she always remembered to keep her relationship with God as her main priority. She realized that it wasn't her own strength. It wasn't her own genius. All of it was a gift from God, her creator. And, uh, you know, as you learn about her life, you can easily see that I presented her as this genius, as this creative and holy and prophetically anointed woman who was called by God to build up his church. And she wasn't afraid to leave the safety of the convent to renew the church. All of this is so true, but even great saints like Hildegard had their struggles. Her life was not always easy. For instance, since she was a little girl and continuing throughout her life, she always struggled with sickness. She was always ill with something. There were times where she suffered a uh, partial blindness, inability to walk, lameness. Uh, she had these disorienting and very painful migraines that would cripple her, but she continued to push through because she realized that she couldn't get through all of these letters and preaching and books all by herself. She needed the power of God working in her. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what God said to Paul. And Hildegard lived this, that even though she was weak from her sickness, God's grace was abundantly given to her to allow her to do all these amazing things that she did to bless the church. But she also struggled sometimes with unjust superiors. For instance, when she was 81 years old, she faced a crisis that was probably the most strenuous she had ever endured. You see, uh, there was a cemetery that was attached to her convent, and a young man had been buried there with her permission. She had allowed him to be buried in her convent. But uh, during his life, this man had been excommunicated. So excommunication is where uh, someone does something wrong in order to put themselves outside of the church. And so excommunication is this judgment by the church where they officially declare that this person is no longer in the church. Now, it's it's easy to come back from excommunication. All you have to do is say you're sorry, go to confession, repent, and you'll be welcomed back with open arms. But this man had been excommunicated, uh, but he had, in fact, done this. He had repented before his death. He had received the sacraments. He had been reconciled with the church. He had received Jesus's mercy. And so he was all good. Uh, but some clerics, some priests, didn't think that he deserved a Catholic burial because at one point he had been excommunicated. So they wanted to have his body dug up and removed from this Catholic cemetery. Now, Hildegard, when she heard their plans, she disagreed and she wouldn't let them do it. She believed in the mercy of God, that even though he had been excommunicated, that he had been outside the church, she said he had repented. He had asked God for forgiveness, and she said, God is merciful. He forgave him. When he went to confession, this young man, he was forgiven. And so she said, there's no way you're digging up this body and taking it out of the cemetery. She didn't want to dishonor his body, and she believed in the mercy of the Lord. And she stood her ground despite their pressure on her. Now, the bishop wasn't there at the time and so the clerics wrote a letter to him and they skewed the story so that the bishop took their side and as punishment for Hildegard's defiance of them the bishop put her whole convent under uh, a state of interdict now if you haven't heard of what interdict was uh, interdict was something that a bishop could do as a punishment 
where no sacraments could be celebrated in the area that he imposed interdict on. And so it was meant to put pressure on the people who were under this punishment to change their minds so that they could receive the sacraments again. So Hildegard and her whole convent was put under interdict. That meant that no sacraments could be said in their convent. They couldn't hear mass. They couldn't uh, receive communion. They couldn't go to confession. They couldn't receive last rites. No sacraments were allowed. But Hildegard refused to back down. She knew that this man who was dead and buried in her cemetery had repented, that Jesus's mercy was available to him, that he had taken that, and she would not let his body be so treated just because some clerics didn't believe in the mercy of God like she did. It was a very tense situation. They sent a lot of letters back and forth, but finally Hildegard won. And just in time too, because that very year, uh, she died peacefully in her convent. The bishop had re uh, removed the interdict, so she was able to receive all the sacraments, and she had a very peaceful and happy death. Now, there's so much that could be said about this fascinating saint, but I think that one of the most fascinating things about Hildegard, especially that she can teach us about holiness, is that holiness doesn't mean that you have to be a boring person. Just because you're a saint doesn't mean that you have some kind of colorless uh, personality. I mean, look at her. She was this woman who was creative, imaginative, feisty, intelligent, curious, and yet she's a great saint. Sometimes people have this false perception that saintliness necessarily looks boring. That you kind of float around all the time looking up at heaven with your arms folded and you're always serious and you never know how to have fun. This is what some people mistakenly think it means to be a saint. But the truth is, is that saints are often the most creative and unique people. Why? Well, because they live out of their true identity that God gave them. God created them to be that way. You see, God doesn't make robots. He doesn't make copies. Every single human being is made unique and he loves our uniqueness. He's the creator. So everything about your personality, all your likes, all your uh, creative side, all of that is his idea. And he wants you to flourish in that, just like Hildegard did. Hildegard excelled in the sciences. She had a passion for life that flowed out of this relationship that she had with God. And it was this devotion to God that led her to be this creative, fascinating person that she was. It was this passion that led her to becoming this incredible saint that we can imitate. So let's pray now to St. Hildegard von Bingen so that we can become saints like she was with this creative genius that God has given to each and every one of us in his own unique way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Hildegard, you had an openness to hear God's voice in all things. You heard him in scripture. You saw his work in nature. You were able to worship him through music. Help us be able to see God speaking to us in all the many ways he wants to. You had a bravery, St. Hildegard, to share what God had taught you. You weren't afraid of ridicule or persecution. Help us, like you, to stand up for what's right, to not be afraid to speak the truth of God, even though we face ridicule. St. Hildegard, you used your strengths that God had given you out of gratitude to God. You were able to glorify God even in your weakness, in your struggles. Let God work through us too. Let us use the strengths that God has given us so that we can become a saint like you were, that we can be the people that God made us to be. Not the kind of person that others want us to be, but the person who God has created us to be, authentically ourselves, passionately in love with God, just like you were. St. Hildegard von Bingen, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.